Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn From Us podcast. As always, my name is Seth Kirchanan. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'm here with Paul, native Akronite, Richfield, Brexville. Not really. I keep saying Brexville because it's, it's just native. Right it's not really native. It's well, yeah, of course not native. Canton. Native Iraqi. I, I, Iraqi, yes. I you really call you, you call yourself a Canton? Canton well, I mean, guy? 1990 and on. I was nine years old, moved to Canton. I mean, I consider that pretty much where I'm from. Well, thank you for joining us. We were just talking about Tiger Woods uh, winning the Masters. Paul loves him. I, I don't. I dislike Tiger Woods. I actually don't know much of I, things that anyone could like about Tiger Woods. So the fact point, that he though, wins. So Tiger Woods and the Chicago, then the early '90s Chicago Bulls. Everyone jumps on the bandwagon. We love them because they win. But uh, I don't like anything about Tiger Woods. Different. I'm not a hater I think in this it's world. Different with individual sports versus team sports. Well, I struggle with golf anyway. I see all these y- y- idiots on the course, and they're just bursting in joy for some guy who could give a shit less about you, really. Like, they just, you know, they're well, out the there. What's the difference ma- between that and Browns? Um, a Browns, for me, is a community. Whether they win, lose, I don't care if they don't even have a team. I'm You're still a Browns You're telling me the Tiger Woods support is not a community. I don't know. He just doesn't care about them. In fact, like, I've Well, been- neither do the Browns. The Browns don't care about you either. It does it, it, The Please Browns, tell me you have a better argument than this. The Browns are more... The Browns is a city. The Browns is uh, my my grandparents. The Browns is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you love Tiger. Everyone says, this. oh, golf so much better with Tiger. Tell me why. I don't even want to have this conversation with you. Well, the other topic <laughs> we're going to bring up is even <laughs> spicier. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the viewership on this podcast <laughs> is going to skyrocket. Paul is reading a book, which very few people do anymore. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love um, reading books. You, no, I, I don't do the Kindles. Listen. Uh, my wife and I struggle because we'll say, well, we read a book, but really we listen to it on tape, you know, on Yeah, I remember we had this conversation and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and Seth got defensive about it. Hey, Tim, we're No, in. no, 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 no. Darnell. He did, but then you were like, well, what's the difference? I'm like... No, that's not true. I don't think so. No, I certainly know that I'm a lesser human than you. No, I didn't even, I, I didn't even say that. Because Dar- I don't read. But <laughs> Darnell, way, think, Darnell thinks that you are equals. And you read a book <laughs> and, and he listens to I it. I asked you... Is reading the same as li- you're like? Well, no, true. it's not. I'm like, thank you. That's all I was trying to get at. Was he? He always says, "Oh, I read this book," and I'm like, "Well, Darnell, you were in the car driving to an appointment. You hit the play button and you listened to some guy speak. Fine, great. But to say I I read this book, I, I, I you'll see in this book as I pull out this. Oh, Show hurt. us this book. Now, this is not the Quran. It's <laughs> not the Quran or the Bible. But this I have is, notes in here. I, I, t- I highlight things. I, I, I bracket things. And then later on, I have an assistant go put everything that I put in brackets on, onto a Google Doc. Yeah, so do I. Tell, me, tell us about <laughs> this book and why it's so intriguing to you. What struck you so poorly about the Tiger Woods thing? You're like, you're like damn that. By the way, can I make a comment? Sure. I told my brother after he won, I go, I never, ever want to know Tiger Woods because I don't want to hate him. So the exact same thing you said. Like, yeah, he might not be a good person, but I can't deny his talent. And I, and I, golf is better when when, when I don't like seeing bad people succeed. What makes him a bad person? Because he's not nice. Does that make him to a bad person? Anybody, I guess. So let me ask you a question. Go ahead. If he was nice, but then on the I'd side did what, terrible. Di- but what if he did terrible things on the side that you didn't know about? Well, if I didn't know about it, then so be it. There's plenty of people who do things that I don't know well, about. Well, that's my point. We know about Tiger. What about Phil? Everyone loves Phil because he's nice to everybody. Hey, listen, you know the so, rumor, you know the rumors about his um his philandering. Uh oh, no. Oh, they're quite prevalent. Like, as in police were called to, to Glenmore Country Club because his uh, girlfriend on the side threw a fit of rage and his wife had to come clean it all up for him. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> you you better, didn't hear that from me, though. Allegedly, for the record. Now, look at this book. Let so me, this is called Security this Analysis. Now, this is ridiculous. This is the book that to, for every 100 people who claim they've read it, three have actually read it. So what I'm doing now is there's a very nice guy named Gary Mashuris in Boston, Massachusetts. And he's a value investor, and he has a fund where he invests his own style. I found, he found me on LinkedIn. I found him on LinkedIn. Something like that happened. So one day, he reached out to me about something, and I wrote back. I said, Gary, do you really want to know my opinion, or is this a, is this a, a mass email? He goes, no. You know, I know you're, you seem to be a value guy, and I want to get your opinion on something. And I said, okay. So then I said, let's get on the phone and chat sometime. So we chatted on the phone, and he said to me, you know, I tutor people in security analysis. I said, I said Gary, I have security analysis. I've tried to read it like three or four times, I've gotten to page four and then I fell asleep and couldn't do it anymore. This book is worse than paint drying. 
Let me let me just let me just uh, give you a, a, a spicier <laughs> excerpt that Paul highlighted. This must be incredibly important. In the pre-war period, it was well considered. It was a well considered view that when prime emphasis was laid upon what was expected of the future, instead of what had been accomplished in the past, a speculative attitude was thereby taken. Speculation, in its etymology, meant looking forward. Investment was allied to vested interest. To prop. Wow. So you know what's funny about I, I that? That's exactly the Amazon thing right there. I can't keep going. Exactly. And you know what I end up doing? So, there, so Seth, this book says, taking out the index, it says, how many pages? 729. But there are about 200 pages of forewords and intros of every single section. So it's about 530 pages. Because the, the book was originally published in the 20s or something? 1934. Okay, 34. I have read each page at least two times. So I read something, I read not a page, a paragraph. I read it over, I read it over, and I read it over. And some of them I go through quickly and some I have to read over four, five, six times. And I still don't click. This is the driest. I've been reading this book since January. Mm -hmm. This book is exhausting, but it's so important. Why? This is the Bible to, Bible to value investing. The intelligent investor is like a Dr. Seuss book compared to this book. This breaks down things to look at in minute details on balance sheets and income statements. I thought I knew investing and then I started reading this book and talking to Gary about investing. And I still knew, he even says like, okay, well you have the mind for this, you know, et cetera. But there are still things I get massively wrong and there are things we debate and talk about. And there are quite, he sends me questions every section and we go through them and I answer them and he goes, okay, I think you're right here. I don't think you're right here, but he's a very humble man. And he says sometimes like, well, I don't take it to mean this. Doesn't mean I'm right and et cetera. So this book is the Bible of value investing. And I will probably read this book several more times in my life in small pieces because it is dry as F. But it's important to understanding how to find true value and how to understand things from a value perspective. What have you learned? I have learned, so I will say this, and this is meant to be, this is not meant to be arrogant. I've learned that my, that my natural way of thinking was very much in line with this book. I've learned very minute details about how to read certain parts of income statements that before I might have under, might have taken and accepted as opposed, like the, like when we do deal of the week, somebody gives you a pro forma. Well, people have to realize that a financial statement from a company, even a publicly traded company, it might be factual in how they portray it. But the things underlying it, like what makes up certain parts of it, could be a complete bullshit statement. Mm -hmm. And those are the things to learn along the way. And these are the things I'm trying to learn in this book. And as time goes on, I will reread parts and understand them better and better. Do you have any friends who've read this book? I do not know anybody who's read this book. What are the reviews on Amazon for this puppy? <laughs> well, I'm sure a lot of reviews are like the typical, like, oh, this is a great book. You must own it. And it probably has 10,000 reviews. And I, and I literally have never met anybody who's legitimately read this book besides Gary in full in their life. So on Amazon, there are 365 reviews, which I'm even surprised are that much. Four and a half stars. And let's see what they say. Just the fact that you pick up that phone, I'm just in amazement to realize when we were like kids that that phone, the internet, and all the info you're looking did not exist. Like, this is so fast. Like, within seconds, you're like, oh, and on Amazon, it has this many reviews. Yes. What are they saying about it? Um, well, it's more about this edition, not being close enough to the original edition, stuff like that. I mean, not being... Oh, look at that. Out of the 52 chapters that comprise this masterful work, 11 have been omitted from the actual book along with the appendix, which houses a great deal of statistical data that adds, oh, then maybe I'll go get the original one. You want to go back in time and read an older version? Not go back in time, but I'll go read the original version, yeah. What care, if, when this is made into a movie, would you be in it? <laughs> <laughs> um, this seems like, I'm confused by this book. Is this like... Something you'll just feel better about yourself or you, you keep saying you're actually learning stuff from this. So the next step after this book is, and I'm going to talk to Gary about this, is, okay, Gary. This is your investor coach? Yes. Let's go pick a company and look at it the way we look at it through this book. Let's go pick their income statement, balance sheet, their debt structure, and figure out, based on the things I learned in this book, how it apply it to that analysis. I don't think I'm smart enough to read this book. Well, you have a PhD in chemistry. But knowing what the words mean, like icosahedral borane complexes to you, might not help me. When bonds or preferred stocks have been converted into common, 
Okay. Great, great rapper or whatever. <laughs> Hip hop artist. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand, but this is this is not something that if I read 15 years ago, I would have understood. Okay. But over time, you read more and more and understand that. But that, I'm not telling everybody to read this book. In fact, it's a terrible idea. Quite the idea. opposite. Yeah. Yes, it's a terrible idea to read this book unless you have some sort of, I think, financial understanding of financial statements, et cetera. Like I gave, I told... um. MJ, Michael Jordan, I want to clarify, Michael Jordan that we talk about is not the real Michael Jordan. We're not name dropping. The Michael Jordan we're talking about is actually a boring doctor in Mansfield, Ohio. Uh-huh. Just kidding, MJ. He got The Intelligent Investor. I think that's a good book that if you have some understanding of money, you can understand that book. But even that one's boring. Mm-hmm. Now, Michael, Ryan Hartshoes, the same thing. Now, Mike, uh, MJ, um, the, you know, um, he's a poker guy. And, oh, yes. And he's read every poker book that so I'm not surprised yes. he would go after a book because he ha- he studies he studied that game like a, a true mathematician, and and so I'm not surprised. I, and I, I told him that I said to him, like every value investor I know plays poker and chess because mm-hmm. that's what poker is. Poker is about you have a hand dealt to you and you know the chances of it being right are X, but are you always right? Of course not. No, when I pull up with four, you know quad quick kings like I've done twice already. Thank you for reminding <laughs> us. We haven't played poker in a while, so I haven't been able to drop that in there. Quad kings, yes. You're not going to beat me. And if I get quad kings a thousand times in my life, I'm going to lose one or two times. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's the whole point. Value investing is the same thing. You do your analysis. You sit there and say, I'm reasonably confident that this is the case. And guess what? You're going to be wrong sometimes. Investing, as much as I used to think it was a science, it's an art. It's two value investors can look at the same asset and one can say buy and one can say sell. It all depends on how they analyze the data. All the data is given to you, it's how you interpret that data. Same with a real estate deal. They give us pro forma, they give us all this data, how we analyze it, that cap rate idea. Well, what's a cap rate? Well, it's whatever you choose it to be. The question is, over time, it ends up being a certain amount in certain areas based on demand, based on perception, et cetera, right? So the same thing with investing, and that's what this book's all about is talk about euphoria, talk about people's emotions, and talk about that this was written after the Great Depression. So they do a lot of references to the Great Depression. They say, hey, during the Great Depression, there were companies that were selling for less than the money in their balance sheet. Like you could have paid off all their debts, taken off all their cash, and bought the company for less than the cash in the account. Hmm. Is that reasonable? So you look at that going, okay, there's obviously some emotional way. But three years prior, you'd have to pay 100 times more for that exact same company. Hmm. Why? So that's the whole point of this book. It's understanding the numbers. That way, when the bad times happen from emotion, you can take less emotion into it and say, okay, well, wait a second. People are driving the price down on this thing, but why? Well, because they misunderstood X, Y, and Z, and I understand that part. So I'm going to go ahead and buy this. All right, great. And I'll be wrong sometimes, but the point of this book is I will do less deals. I will buy less companies, less stocks, but over time I will do better with the ones I do buy. This, this is a, this is a quite a patience you have to develop to be this type of investor. Yeah. It's, um, you know, the patience comes from fucking up. You know what I mean? When you screw up a couple of times and you, you determine how much you hate losing money, then you sit there and go, there's gotta be a better way. And I've chosen the path for myself of, I'd rather do less, but be very successful when I do what I do, as opposed to do more and then hate some deals and like some deals that I had no reason to understand why I liked them or didn't like them. Like a stock. Like as I see Amazon go up and up and up, I don't feel like, damn, I missed out on Amazon. I feel like, I don't understand how that happened. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't feel like I missed out on Amazon. When I see Tesla go up and up and up, I don't feel like, damn, I missed out on Tesla. No. Your wife's ex-boyfriend had Tesla at 120, and he was talking about it. I go, yeah, I have no desire to own it at 120. And what's it at now? What did it get to? It got 383 or something like that. I don't remember. It got to 383. Ask and your phone. What is Tesla stock at? Tesla closed up $258.66. 258? Yeah, it's down a lot. 258? Yeah, it's down a lot. I was going to say 370. No, it's down a lot. I knew it was down a lot. <sighs> my, my nine-year-old has one Tesla stock. He'll be crushed. <laughs> When he makes like six dollars in a day, it's like the best thing ever. But now that he's <laughs> down, he bought it three hundred. Oh boy. Uh oh. Uh oh, Pascadios. You know, I'm driving that car around and I'm trying to be a fanboy and then, and then the reports come out that <laughs> that they put that car together in like a t- makeshift tent in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like like seriously, bro. It's a sixty thousand dollar car and when it rains, water gets in the trunk. 
Does it really? I got to take it to the shop. In the trunk, trunk. It, it, like it like dribbles like yeah, it dribbles in like a. Well, either way, the whole point is I look at the financials and I go, <laughs> yeah, there's no chance I'm even owning this stock. And I don't lose any sleep over it. We went to a thousand dollars a share. I don't sit there and go like, damn, I missed out on it. I go, all right, good for somebody else. I didn't, I didn't do it. Yeah, that takes a great amount of patience. Um, have you been catching up on this uh, Jeopardy winner? Dude, he's killing it. He's by, 34. By the time this airs, he'll probably have made seven billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. But um, we're but through it, episode I, at 13 or 14. Yeah, so. I was gonna say he's made like. One but it's astonishing. I mean, I, I haven't actually, unfortunately, I haven't actually watched it. Just a couple of highlights. He had a perfect game the other day. Well, yeah, when he rung in, he answered every question. Yeah, 40, so he had 40 for 40. 40 for 40. But it's astounding. Like I saw one episode, or at least the back half of one. Where like you know going into Final Jeopardy, these two opponents had like five grand and he had seventy one thousand. I mean it's just like, and he still bet like forty five thousand dollars on the question. Yeah, sixty. Yeah, it's incredible. This dude, I hear he's pretty cocky too. So oh, is he really? That's what I've heard. He's just kind of snooty and just cocky about it. Which I mean, I guess he can be at this point. Yeah, so. but Ken Jennings wasn't. No, he was lovable. Yes, yeah, but um, when he lost, he was just like. Okay. What a bunch of dorks we are, like analyzing these books and talking about Jeopardy champions. You know what, though? It's fun. And when you're past high school, you realize how like important that really is. Like, you know, I, I really struggle as a parent. Um, I grew up, I really struggle as a parent because I want my kids to be good in sports. Yeah. And I, I told you this before, I never know why. Like, sports is great and all. But um, I wonder if they were just dorks like Uncle Paul in high school, if they'd have a better life. I don't know. Not happiness wise. Yeah. But like, you know, as you said, money and can financially. Financially can lead to being listen, we had a lot happier of, things. We had a lot of, listen, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm sure they're not listening. I'm not envious. Andrew and I are the only dorks of our fellow group of dorks that I'm sitting there going like there's a few of them where I'm just like, I would never take their life ever. And I'm like, and you know, being a nerd is my joke to the kids is when I used to do like career day at Walsh was, all right, who's the numbers nerd in the class? Everybody points to some little kid. I go, yeah, girls hang out with him. Cause you're going to want to date him in 15 years. Well, you see that's yeah. You know, it's funny is I see a lot of parents who are very, very invested in their kids sports and you know, well, you probably don't know, but it's completely insane. Like, Oh, Darnell's daughter is oh. like a great soccer player now. And he's like, Two teams. He's traveling everywhere. Uh, yeah. Well, oh, we're going to South Kentucky t this weekend for three days to play 17 soccer games <laughs> yeah. over the weekend. I'm just like, man. So I'm trying not to keep up, keeping up with that. Like, you know, like just do, let's do fraction. Like, so we'll sit and do fraction flashcards because I'm like, man, I wish someone would have told me that I didn't have to try and be some athletic superstar. That's the thing. What, what, what are they expecting? Oh, Dear friends think their kids are going to play in the major leagues. By the way, they might. Very there, well. There's a kid, um, I just heard this the other day, there was a kid from my brother's class or the year after, and or maybe, no, no, maybe it was in different high school, and he had the license plate in high school, MLB one day. And guess what? He's in the pros now. And everybody thought that was so cocky and arrogant back then. Well, when it turns out, I mean, great. Listen, and I'm, not trying to, I'm a big believer in, hey, if you want to try it, go for it. But don't forget the backup of you better be able to do fractions. You know, we're talking to somebody right now who's a retired baseball player. He got drafted and then didn't make it much out of the minors, but a great guy, smart guy, very articulate, lives in Atlanta. He goes to Emory now for his MBA, but it didn't work for him. So he's now, you know, in the, but at least he studied with school. He went to Georgia Tech. He studied and he had that bad, his parents or his dad's, I think, an ophthalmologist or a, or a lawyer or something like that. And it's like, I think an ophthalmologist. And so they had this education background with them and you never know. I mean, I told Darnell, I'm like, so you're hoping for a free college? He goes, absolutely. But guess what? You can get to a free college without going to Ohio State or Michigan or some other big school. You can still go to a small D3 school and still get a free ride, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I played college sports all through, I mean, until I was senior year. So, I mean. Did you get any scholarship? No, uh, I mean, in Division three, they don't call it a scholarship, but you get like uh, grants maybe, extra like how grants. Much? Well, maybe like ten thousand bucks a year oh, out of like good. maybe thirty four thousand total or something. I mean, maybe it was yeah, it wasn't bad. It was, it was a nice like, hey, we're giving you this grant to play. I never actually thought if I quit, it would go away. I can't remember, but I mean, um, and maybe it has to do with like what my parents were making at the time. I, I don't know, but I mean, I, I'm a huge sports guy. I played them all, played to win. You know, I'm still very competitive, but I just see like. Just, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I mean, we're, we're talking about like I had a pretty good GPA. I still have a PhD in chemistry, so maybe that's the considered a nerd as well. But um, I just wish I would have known some of this stuff. You know, like if my side hustle 
was maybe finding a property with help from my dad or Uncle Paul, um, like, you know, like guiding me, Paul. guiding me through my at 19, you know, my, if my side gig was working on a house with my dad or my, my father-in-law, as opposed to just grabbing ass and playing Halo. But who would have told you that? Seth, you saw me in high school. I mean, maybe you didn't know I was doing this stuff, but back in high school, I was, I was looking at stock, reading stock books, not this thing, but yeah. other books that I thought were better. And it would have been impossible to get you to listen to that. Impossible. Not because it's you, because that's typical kids. Well, that's what I mean. I'm trying to wonder how, I mean, I got two kids, so. You know, you do it. You do it in small ways, like things like, even though I don't agree with, with Geo buying Tesla stock, yeah. you got him at least to go, hey, Geo, why do you want, now maybe then you go, okay, Geo, it's gone down. Why do you think it's gone down? Well, Uncle Paul thinks it's We talk about that all the time, supply and demand. You know what it was? <laughs> it was this funny, uh, I got toothpaste from the airport. It was like six ninety nine. And I was just like, Geo, why is this a dollar ninety nine across the street, six oh, ninety nine in the airport? Great, and what do you say? He said, oh, he, he got it. He Did said, he? well, yeah, because you need that. And when you get in the airport, you can't leave and go buy it. Wow. So he's getting it. And he's what, eight years old? Just turned nine. Holy cow. So I guess that's how you start doing it. So, but I guess the point is inherently, I still as a sports guy, like, come on, man, let's go outside and play well, catch. Why does it matter? I guess it doesn't, yeah. By the way, I love sports. I played sports. You do? You still do? I do. And I, Multiple Even sports. back then, I'm just like, but at the end of the day, the chance of you becoming a professional athlete, one in every thousand high school football players will even play in the pros. Forget about having a career. Oh, thousand? No, no, a thousand. Oh, no, it's way more than that. I thought it was one in a thousand. High, high school football players. Oh, I'd be shocked if it's even that high. I mean, it's a percentage well, of a percentage. Well, well, think, yeah, that it's, is a percentage. It's three or four kids out of a whole team even play college. Yep. And, and it's the, going to be one out of every four years. Is that one out of a thousand? About. <laughs> <laughs> no, Paul, you're wrong. It's not one. It's like, it's like I'll see you quarter seven. You know, I got some things to do. How about 745? <laughs> what movie is that from? Oh, yeah, Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber. Dumber. Yeah, quarter Dumber. Eight. I even screwed up the joke. Yeah, yeah. Eight, but, but I remember reading it once. It was one out of every thousand high school. But by the way, that means we'll even play in the NFL, which means practice squad. I mean, to even make a career out of it where you can like. Forget make, about it. Uh, yeah, it's such a hard number. I, uh, I went to school with a kid at Worcester and he was the absolute cat's pajamas at running back. I think he set the division three record for like his first so and so many game I mean, 45 touchdowns in 10 games. Yeah. And he got to the practice squad with the Browns and cut. Can't, yeah, cut. Same thing with Darnell, right? Well, Darnell made four years and that's four considered years. a good, that's cons the average NFL career is like two and a half. Yeah. I was going to say two years and change or whatever it is. Yeah. Two and a half with some brain injuries and yeah. yeah, it's tough. And so Darnell had a longer career than normal. And you know what the funny part is? Darnell thinks his career ended because of caring about business more. He goes, they'd always tell me, we wish you studied your um, your playbook as much as you studied your little book business books. Yeah. It's because Darnell was interested by that. Like we have to do what, my big thing for kids though, Seth, is you can find a way to teach them. Like look, for example, Lisa's son, Daniel. Whenever we talk about things, I relate it to sports because he likes sports. So for example, something like, Supply and demand. Well, why does this athlete make 20 million? That makes 10. Why do any athletes in general make millions of dollars? It's supply and demand mm -hmm. because it's really hard. You have the number one running back in division three football history, got cut from the, got, got on the practice squad and got cut from the practice squad from the Browns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Practice squad folks pays about $1,500 per week back then. Mm hmm. I mean, that's 75 grand a year, but as an athlete getting banged up and having a temporary career. Well, it's, I mean, I guess now what it comes down to it, it's just much more fun than being a value investor or a heart surgeon. It, it really is. And, and by the way, I'm telling you, you can do both. Yeah. Right? I yeah. always wonder to myself, like, what have I, I mean, the one thing I regret from college, high school is not working on my legs and becoming a kick, field goal kicker. I always say that. I'm just like, field goal kicking. Why? Because it allowed me to get in the football. I have strong legs. Maybe I could have kicked a field goal and I'd not get myself hurt, not get pounded by guys like you or mm. bigger or Darnell just trying to pack me. Mm -hmm. Field goal kicker. We made the state championship on the leg, a 42-yard field goal from a freshman. That's who kicked that field goal when we were really? in high school. Yeah, was it was a freshman? Freshman. 42-yard soccer player. Kicked it for us. By the way, the year Connor Cook went pro Yeah. from Walsh. To Michigan State. From Michigan State. I think that class had four kids get signed that year in the NFL. Walsh Jesuit High School? His graduating class. Two were kickers or something like that, and they got mm. signed. They were undrafted, but two guys got drafted. I mean, that had, to be the, that had to be some kind of record. Yeah. Or at least that year. That was, I mean, four kids from the same high school class got, got drafted from a prep school in Ohio. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, that was a little tidbit. I think it was four.
you know Mike Vrabel, the Tennessee Titans head coach? He went to our high school. Yeah. yeah. Way before our time, though. Well, thanks for talk, talking to me, Paul. Thanks for everyone else for joining us for the podcast. We wanted that to be a short podcast. It was not. It was not? Go out and get this book. <laughs> Do not get this book. <laughs> Do not get this, is gonna this be the book. Only, this is going to be the only podcast that you'll ever hear where the, 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 the reader <laughs> recommends the book only to himself. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, don't get the book. <laughs> don't waste a, your time. A good, it's really hot in here, isn't it? I got, I'm working up a lava. <laughs> a healthy lava. <laughs> balls in here. Jesus Christ. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Learnfromus.com. If you want uh, this nerd in across from me to guide you in buying real estate, he's the man to call. You'll make a lot of money. That's true. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>